Signore e signori, buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana, Zerilli Marimò della New York University. It's a great pleasure to host this program this evening, in which we will be talking about essential topics. And what is more essential than food? And not only because we are Italian, because we are human. And uh, we have the great pleasure also to talk about food with two uh, great experts in the field, to both professors in the food studies program here at NYU, one of the most prominent in the country. And for me, it's a particular reason of joy to welcome back uh, to Casa Italiana after he has been appointed a professor uh, here at NYU again, after a short stay in an exile that was not too far at the new school, just same block, uh, Professor Fabio Parasegui. I'm, so I'm delighted to have him back at NYU to be part of the family and to have him on the stage of the Casa. I'm going to give you a short uh, version of the bios of our, of our guests. Uh, you can find them um, in their entirety in our website, clicking on the names. Everything is clickable on our website. And I also want to take advantage of this little introduction to invite you, if you're not, to log in to your uh, little things and devices, let people know what we're doing right here, right now, and invite them to see our live streaming either on our Facebook page or on our website. So that's a way to get other people involved in the conversation, in the discussion. So um, Mary Lusovsky, uh, who is going to be in discussion with Fabio Parasicoli, teaches and writes about food, meaning and identity, and using food as a lens into cultural issues that span from race, class, ethnicity, and the environment. She's an adjunct professor in the Department of Nutrition and Food Studies here at New York University. And she is a physician by training. She has an MD uh, from Harvard University Medical School. And the thing that strikes me most in her bio is that she's in the board of the Joyce Theater, not far from here. And it's one of my favorite places in New York. And I invite all of you to support the Joyce and going to see the fantastic contemporary modern dance program that they offer. So as you see, it's a Renaissance woman with a wide span of interest. And again, her publications and other achievements are in the complete uh, biography. Fabio Parasecoli is a professor of food studies here at New York University, uh, and his scholarly work explores food, popular culture and politics, and particularly in food design. He studied East Asian cultures and political science in Rome, Naples, and Beijing, and earned a PhD in agricultural sciences with a concentration in gender and nutrition from Hohenheim University in Germany. The thing that relates to the Far East and all that, he also used that in his career because he was a journalist covering exactly this topic for several years for publications from France, Spain, and Italy. So food, again, is one of the many interests of Fabio. Right now, I think it's the prevailing interest, but by far not the only one. And as you will see from the book they're presenting tonight, the discussion is also about the connections between food choices, politics, and economics. Um, his current research project includes a three-year grant from the National Science Center of Poland to explore the re-evaluation of traditional and regional food in Poland, and a Fulbright Specialist grant to study food heritage creation approaches and processes, and a book project on Global Brooklyn, a restaurant and cafe design and service approach that has reached worldwide visibility. So we have two great experts. We're going to talk about a fundamental topic in all of our lives. And there is nothing else left for me than inviting you to please welcome the Professor Fabio Parasecoli and Professor Mary Rosowski. Thank you. Good evening, benvenuti a tutti. It's really a pleasure to be here with you. I will say I am pinch hitting for Mitchell Davis, so I have very big shoes to fill. And as you've heard, I have the privilege of being in conversation with someone who really meets the definition of a Renaissance man, uh, <laughs> journalist, critic, author, food scholar. Uh, we could go on and on. Uh, but in this context, I'll just say he's a polyglot, a polymath, and I'm proud to say my friend. So it's really uh, a, a great delight 
Fabio to get to talk with you about your latest book, although I should, I meant to check Amazon to make sure that food is in fact his latest book. He's so prolific that uh, it, since, since this came out in May, I wouldn't be surprised if you have something else on the shelves. So starting with uh, the genesis of this book, Food, by MIT Press that came out in May of this yes. year. Uh, what inspired you to write this? First of all, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Stefano, and really thank you, Meryl, uh, for being here. I really appreciate it. We've been friends for many years, and it's great to, to do this together. Uh, the book came actually as an invitation from MIT. Uh, for a few years, I had a space on Huffington Post before they closed it suddenly. I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago. Um, and so an editor at MIT had been reading my material, and they uh, reached out to me because they have a new series called Essential Knowledge, uh, and you can see it at the bottom of the cover. And it's a series in which basically experts in contemporary issues uh, discuss specific themes uh, with a good level of information and research, but in a way that it's very accessible for the general public. So, I mean, MIT called, and I was very pleased, and we started discussing what to do with this book. And I asked them, so what do you think the book should be about? And they said, food. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it, it's, nice little topic. <laughs> right? It, it was a little wide. Um, so we started discussing, and then eventually we focused on a few topics, and these are the topics we'll discuss this evening that I think are in particularly important to understand how the f how food systems work today. So it's not so much a, a book about traditions or heritage. These are other themes I... I write about, but I try to see how these cultural aspects actually interact with um, economic, political, social dynamics at the global level. Because one thing I really believe is now that food is a, a global system. It's not just American, it's mm -hmm. not just Italian. And so it, it's great for me to be here at Casa Italiana to see, okay, how 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 all these dynamics actually impact uh, Italy and its, and its food culture. And, and of course, you came to the writing of this book as both an Italian and, uh, at least by residence, an American. Also uh, by citizenship now. Oh, that's right. Bravo. <laughs> that's right. So, uh, you know, as Mary Nessel, who we're honored to have in the audience, has taught us all, food is political, but it's also, of course, deeply personal. So for you, yeah. Fabio, from a personal perspective, given your background as a native of Rome, yes. but now a longtime resident and a citizen uh, <laughs> of New York and the United States, how did uh, those facets of your personal background inform your perspective in writing yeah. food? I think it's they, they both really coincide. I mean, last week I was back in Rome to celebrate my mother's 80th birthday, and we spent two whole days cooking. You know, I a, saw the pictures. We all want to be invited for her 81st. <laughs> a small party for 13, but she decided to cook, I don't know, 20 different dishes. <laughs> but, you know, Italian mamas. Um, and, and so, in a way, I, I was raised in a, in, a, in a culture that gives a lot of relevance to, to food, but it's, at least when I was growing up, was also quite insular. It was our food already, for me, growing up in Rome, the food of Florence or the food of Naples were slightly exotic. Mm. Um, it was really, really local. And then I started traveling, you know, I studied in China, and, and I realized that our food is much more complicated, even when we don't realize it is. And for me, this was one of the important messages to, um, to send through this book. Even if we're just, you know, enjoying a lunch among friends, by doing that, we're part of a much larger and complex networks of connections, of movements, of mm -hmm. things, of peoples, of I ideas. You know, you go to an Italian restaurant here in New York, you might have an Italian chef. So he comes from Italy or she comes from Italy with their own ideas, their traditions, their way of feeling things. But then the sous chef might be from Guatemala. 
and the server might be a New Yorker, and the guests are New Yorkers, and where does the food come from? Mm. You know, so in, in every little gesture, in every little act of consumption of food, we're part of this very complicated um, networks. In and some and way. you really ascribe to us as consumers a very active role and responsibility. You talk a lot in your book about how uh, it's not enough for us to be consumers, but we really have to reclaim our position as citizens in, in the food world. Uh, you write, voting with our wallets isn't enough. Forms of collective and political action are necessary and urgent. And it, this certainly seems like a natural sentiment in a place like Italy that gave birth to the slow food movement mm. back in 1986. Yes. Uh, and yet you also explain uh, in your book that in Italy, citizens sort of expect their government to take the lead in matters such as GMO labeling or regulation of sugared drinks. Uh, so how do you see the role of consumer as citizen play out differently in Italy compared with yeah. the United States? Uh, that, that, it's, it is quite different. So we are raised in, with the idea, you know, that the government makes rules and it's supposed to protect you. So food safety, for instance, uh, it's very important for us that government, uh, before it was Italy, now it's the EU. All these regulations happen at the EU level. But we ex <clears throat> expect them to make sure that the food that enters the EU uh, responds to certain standards. I mean, sometimes there is an exaggeration because the EU is creating so many standards that now, you know, we have to measure apples and bananas, but that's, you know, mm. that happens with such an international large um, large organization, but uh, there is this sense that it's the responsibility of governments to make sure that the food system works as as well as possible. Of course, that it, it, sometimes it doesn't happen. In Italy, we had some important scares. Uh, in 1984, uh, the wine industry almost collapsed. Mm when there was methanol uh, in a few bottles of wine and some people died. And suddenly, people didn't want to drink wine any longer, right? And nobody wanted to import Italian wine. So mm. the Italian industry had to completely change its approach. How did they restore trust after that? Just changing their ways completely mm. from the way wine was, uh, the, the vines were grown and the harvest and the bottling and the controls. Mm. So there is this idea, we have uh, a special body in the Carabinieri that takes care of um, food security. Mm. So uh, that's quite, quite important. Here it's more like the system develops and then if something wrong happens then there are interventions and maybe there are recalls and it's a little more reactive here much more reactive mm -hmm. than proactive mm -hmm. in many ways and mm -hmm. and that goes for many aspects of the food system well so as, as you've alluded already one of the under underlying themes throughout your book is uh the, the argument that our food system is increasingly global so I am interested in your take on you know what what is gained and also what is yeah. <laughs> what is gained and what is lost as national foods become globally diffused. Yes, it's it's a complicated issue. And recently, I had meetings with Italian restaurateurs in New York precisely on this. And mm. who are we? What are we doing? And it's interesting because in a way, Italy had its food spread all over the world you know, started, starting at the end of the 19th century with the migrations, and then especially at the beginning of the 20th, millions of Italians mm -hmm. moved to Cuba and Australia and Argentina, the US, of course, Venezuela. And so the- But it was had, originally denigrated, right? And then it- Very much so, because it was the food of very poor people, mm -hmm. people at least here in the US who's also racial, outline was not very clear, were we black or white? You know, there were lots of discussions back, back in the day, especially in places where there were direct boats from Palermo and, you know, other places where we look a little darker um, than the average American. Um, and so th there was this sense of these people that were strange, they were eating very 
um, unhealthy food for the ideas of the time. So why eating so many vegetables? That's bad for you. You know, eat more meat, eat more cheese, eat more eggs. And for Italians, those were festive foods. I mean, people didn't have access to meat or uh, this sort of luxurious thing. Yes. So when people arrived here, it was the land of abundance. And so we see that some traditional dishes started changing, and now we have the Italian-American cuisine, which is its own thing. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we also have the penetration of global food in Italy, which is much deeper than we think it is. First of all, from the point of view of retail, many of our supermarkets are not owned by Italian companies. Mm. So if you mm. think about Lidl, Auchan, uh, Carrefour, Exactly. So these are sort of European conglomerates. And mm. so it's very easy to find either foods that are really not Italian next to Italian foods or Italian foods made abroad. Huh. And at the I, I don't think Italians really thought about that until there were the blue mozzarellas a few years ago. I don't know if you remember. Mm -mm. There were in one of these retail chains, there were packaged mozzarellas. You would open the mozzarella and it would almost instantly turn blue. You know, it was called uh, la mozzarella dei puffi, you know, the, 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 the sh shrooms. Uh, what's the name of the little blue, uh, blue character? Smurfs. Exactly. <laughs> and it was just that it was mozzarella made in Germany. And there was some microorganism, the, the vats had not been cleaned properly. It was not dangerous. You could have eaten it, but would you eat a blue mozzarella? You know, most people were <laughs> a little taken aback. So it wasn't being marketed as the Smurf mozzarella. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> that may, could have been a good idea. Maybe. But so suddenly we realized that even mozzarella can be made somewhere else because mm. legally it's, it's correct. You know, mozzarella is not one of those products protected in a specific way in the European legislation. So it can be made anywhere as long as certain rules of production are and so, followed. So did that then spur a lot of the legislation that, around uh, geographic indication uh, and protecting the, trade, trademark? Those laws already existed, mm -hmm. but I don't think Italian had, Italians had thought about how much f food from abroad gets into their, their Local kitchens, system and exactly. Kitchens. And here now in the US we see this tension between foods that are imported from Italy and Italian sounding foods that are actually made here. Because maybe, you know, a hundred years ago some Italian migrant decided to start making pasta or parmigiano or other products. And yeah. this is becoming a very hot issue for, for Italian producers because they see it as, as a competition, you know, these products are cheaper. Mm. Are, are they the same quality or not? There are lots of discussions and, and you know. questions th about authenticity and identity. And also political issues. So now some of these products are part of the tariff wars that we're seeing mm. in, that our uh, present government is mm. engaged in. Well, so spe speaking of wars, um, you know, sometimes we don't just uh, try to copy Italian food here in this country, but we think that we're going to enhance it. And some of these newfangled competition uh, co combinations can certainly engender uh, spirited <laughs> debate, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, th this image, of course, it, it's a humorous jab at what can happen when, uh, you know, global diffusion and culinary commingling, uh, you know, com come together in, in this way. Uh, but it also hits, hints at a lot of the complexity that you write about, Fabio, in terms of h how our food is grown, processed, packaged, yes. distributed, where it ends up, who combines it, who, who eats it, who defines it as an acceptable or uh, embraceable product. So I'm wondering, can you sort of take us on a little food yeah. uh, food systems journey to help us understand how some of the iconic products here, so the tomato sauce, the wheat flour, and of course the pineapple ring, mm -hmm. found their way together on, in the same dish, yeah. something I'm sure your Nona in Rome never would have imagined. No, actually for most Romans to this day, pineapple <laughs> on pizza is still, you know, <laughs> borderline horror. But, <laughs> Um, 
I would like maybe to talk about two pizzas. One pizza here with yeah. pineapple and one pizza maybe in Rome. And both of them are really global in a way. I mean, here it's mm -hmm. the moment you put pineapple on a pizza, clearly you're part of a network of different exchanges, of different availability of products. I always wonder who had the idea. <laughs> Oh, a Greek. So there we go. A Greek that decides that pineapple is good on Italian pizza. That's globalization for you, right there. And many of the products, especially in the in the you know better pizzerias, do come from Italy. So they would get olive oil, they would get tomatoes, but at the same time, there are also local producers that try to make olive oil and tomatoes in the Italian style. And very often, you mm. find this uh, cans that have Italian images, Italian words, but they are not actually Italian products, they are local products. So you have all these elements. Mm. And the, the wheat, of course, you know, it's local because the US, Canada have, have such a huge uh, pr production. Mm -hmm. But then if you go and see the pizza in Italy, that's globalized too, because in Italy we don't produce much wheat. Keep in mind that most of our territory is, is hills and mountains. Mm -hmm. It's not very good for wheat. So traditionally, there's been a lot of imports of, uh, of wheat, especially from Canada, from the Ukraine. So probably mm. if you eat pizza uh, in Rome, unless you go to a pizza maker that is really keen on finding local grains, mm -hmm. uh, local varieties, which is becoming a very important thing. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a growing trend. But if you go to your run of the mill pizzeria, it would be wheat maybe coming from other places. Tomato, local, but tomato paste might come from China. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the garlic too comes uh, from, from China. Wow. So th there are lots of these products that now we find normally in our markets. But for me, what's also important from this point of view of the globalization of, of our food system is issue, it's the um, issue of labor. So mm -hmm. we make pizza in, in Italy, but in Rome, most of pizza makers come from Morocco and Egypt. Mm. And it's, it's a given, it's nothing strange. Huh. Um, the people who gather and pick the tomatoes in the South, if they are Italian, Italian tomatoes are probably foreigners. We have huge numbers of uh, North African and Middle Eastern people now working in fruit and vegetables industries. Mm. And very often in very hard, uh, harsh conditions, very often mm. they are also exploited by mafia. Mm. And then if you look at, for instance, mozzarella di bufala, you know, one of the best ingredients, there is this weird connection between uh, uh, taking care of the animals and the sick communities from India. And so you would go to these places where they have uh, buffaloes mm -hmm. from which mozzarella is made and you would see Indians taking care of the, mm. of the animal. So mm. you see that there is all this element, you know, globalization is not just the things, right. it's also the people, the people ideas, the, the value, and... exactly. Yes. Interesting. Well, so looking at a pizza, you know, we, you know, among the iconic foods that we tend to mythologize here in this country is, you know, Italian pizza pizza, um, but as we've heard, it's not really all that quintessential when you deconstruct it into its component ingredients. Um, we also tend to think of pizza as a, a less than healthy indulgence, and yet at the same time, we look to the cuisine of Italy, uh, in particular the so-called Mediterranean diet, as the pinnacle of healthy eating. So Fabio, you write in your book about the paradox of the times we're in, where we have access to an unprecedented you know, profusion of food, at least for those who can afford it. Uh, and yet we're overwhelmed, we're anxious about uh, conflicting advice and ideas about what to eat for uh, optimal health and, and nutrition. So you know, here in the US, we, we look at the Mediterranean <laughs> diet, uh, you know, rich <laughs> vegetables, beans, uh, fish, whole grains, and there's something to that joke, also to the, you know, the, the climate and the social support and networks, and you know, the, those were principles really derived from the so-called blue zone uh, work, and the very first blue zone to be identified was in Italy, in Sardinia, that has 10 times the number of centenarians as the United States, and it's attributed 
in part to lifestyle and social connections, but also in large part to the fact that they're still hunting, harvesting, fishing, and eating these healthy Mediterranean foods. Mm -hmm. So with the increasing globalization and all of this exchange and transfer of ingredients, foods, mm -hmm. and lifestyles, uh, our diseases and situations like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and, and other food-related health issues on the rise in Italy? Unfortunately, they are, not only in Italy, all over the Mediterranean. Mm. Just uh, last week, I was in Barcelona for a conference at uh, Barcelona University, and there was an international conference from with people, nutritionists, doctors, food scholars coming from all over the Mediterranean. And there was this sort of awareness that as much as we have more and more research that points to the benefits of Mediterranean diet. And now, you know, the research is about uh, phytochemicals and nutrients mm. that until a few years ago we were not much aware. At the same time, the nutrition, nutrition transition that mm. started in the 50s and 60s has changed our way of eating enormously. Mm. Until the 50s and 60s, yes, probably what Ansel Keys saw mm -hmm. was the Mediterranean diet and he could study certain populations mm -hmm. that were poor but mm -hmm. were healthier than mm -hmm. his patients in the US. Now it's not the case any longer because mm -hmm. people tend to eat more meat, more mm -hmm. cheese, more egg, more sugar mm -hmm. uh, all the time. And so obesity is on the rise, especially among children. That's uh, an important mm -hmm. issue, and it's becoming also very um, a sort of a social um, discriminant, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the 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 better off people eat better, mm -hmm. probably more expensive food, fresher food, and there are other people that m maybe don't have access to that food and tend to eat more mass-produced, packaged foods, and mm -hmm. those are like in the U.S. and very often are the same. Because mm -hmm. there are, uh, you know, transnational companies selling products all over, all over the world. So we definitely see a, a, a big change uh, that is definitely generational. Mm -hmm. So for people of my generation, you know, we were growing up in an Italy that were still at the beginning of the economic miracle, mm -hmm. and then the miracle happened, and so people had more money. And suddenly they changed the way, yes. And, and in fact, began to uh, follow the practices in other wealthy countries where not only is there you know, an abundance of food, there is, as you said, an overabundance that leads to tremendous food waste yes. uh, with you know, enormous consequences for the environment and, and in terms of sustainability. So this is something that you devote a very, uh, very important chapter in your book too, as well. Uh, and sorry, let me catch up. I, I was interested to learn in, in thinking about food food waste in Italy uh, that as recently as 2016, Italy passed a law that included a series of measures to tackle the, this big looming issue of food waste. I think it's been estimated that uh, the typical Italian family wastes upwards of 300 pounds of food a year. Uh, when you multiply that by the population and then by the, the euros or the dollars mm -hmm. that translates to, it's a lot of people you can feed or a, a lot of environmental impact you could avoid. Uh, so the, this new law, among other things, uh, is lowering the hurdles for farmers and food companies to donate uh, leftover or recently expired food that's still safe for yeah. human consumption, but that would have otherwise been left to rot. I think one of the inspirations of this was the Expo Milano in 2015 with a, a big food waste and sustainability theme, and that's when the great uh, Italian chef Massimo Batora uh, created his soup kitchen feeding uh, people in need using mm. solely food that uh, that was left over from the expo, and that that has then spurred, you know, it, it raised a lot of awareness worldwide and spurred uh, other such projects. And then I'm really curious about your take on another part of this law, which was to promote the use of doggy bags. I remember living in Italy in 2000 and 
asking innocently for a doggy bag if I had food left over at the end of a meal. I don't want to waste it. It's so delicious. My favorite thing for breakfast is dinner, so it was all perfect. Yeah. Uh, and I was looked at like I had three heads. Um, so it really hasn't been part of the, the yeah. cultural mindset yet. They're trying to rebrand doggy bag as family bag and encourage more uh, more diners to bring leftover food home from restaurants. Yeah. So how how have these new measures been embraced in Italy? Well, again, there's been a transition there too. Um, in, in the early 60s, 70s, we were still we had a very fresh memory of hunger, or yes. not hunger, but let's say food insecurity, you know. And so we were raised with the idea that you do not throw out food, period. Yeah. So there was a whole art of using leftovers or mm. using, you know, food in all sorts of ways. Of course, that has changed with, with you know, with the affluence, affluence exactly, the, the availability of money and, and food. The restaurant was different because in the re you would go to the restaurant for a special occasion, mm. and also our portions were not that big until mm. quite recently. Mm -hmm. So, and you would also have a sense of how much you wanted to eat, and you wouldn't order too much. I don't know, it was mm -hmm. a whole cultural complex that basically helped you um, navigate menus and mm. avoid um, waste. But mm. now that's clearly changing. Yeah. So you go to a restaurant, you have much larger portions. Mm. And I'm glad that you know people are not looking down at, yeah. at uh, keeping food uh, for, for the day after. I think the work that Massimo is doing, although you know, of course it has got a limited impact, if, just to reiterate what uh, uh, Meryl was saying, Massimo, started in, in, in Milan because there were so many people around for the, the expo and there was food that was bought, it was perfectly good, but then it was not used. Instead of throwing it out, he started cooking it and serving it to um, homeless people mostly mm -hmm. uh, in a place in Milan. And this idea really got on also what he did. He wanted to make these people feel like Respected, dignified. dignified. There, there was a dignity and exactly. beauty to, to... To the place. So he designed the place and also invited very famous chefs to cook for the homeless. So every day there will be a different chef preparing and making amazing food. Mm. As a matter of fact, also Massimo has written a book on how, uh, mm. on the idea of bread, on, on saving bread, of uh, using bread. Recently, Bre bread is gold. Bread is gold. Recently, I was at an event that uh, here in New York, and he was cooking, and he made passatelli with old pizza. You know, when the pizza becomes too hard to eat, mm. he would grind it and make passatelli, which is this dish from Romagna. It's basically, you mix uh, mm. uh, breadcrumbs with cheese, with marrow, with other ingredients, and then you cook it in, in broth, and it was delicious. And the fact that he started doing that in different countries, at a certain point we worked together here in New York to mm -hmm. see if New York could be one of the places eventually mm -hmm. he decided not. Uh, this has changed, you know, now chefs have got this big influence in terms of media outreach. And so what he did, I think, was uh, quite important, but I think, Although I really respect what he does, and again, you know, he has people thinking, the issues are much more systemically. Where yes. does the, f yes. the waste happen? You know, yeah. waste is not just in our fridges or yes. in the store. Uh, fridge, uh, waste happens in the distribution. It happens on the fields. Yes. And until a few years ago, there were also EU regulations that uh, put quotas to certain production. So if you produce more than a certain amount of certain things, you had to destroy them. And that's something that many people resented deeply, mm -hmm. you know, because why are we destroying tomatoes and oranges mm -hmm. while, you know, why people are, are starving? So it's and, a and whole And it used complex. to be that even if uh, the regulatory hurdles were lowered and farmers could donate surplus food or companies, uh, it, it, it cost them money to yes. do it. So, so now I think they can transfer the food yes. in a cost-free way. And they're trying also to re-educate the children. So if you go to schools, you know, they're trying to have them think about uh, mm -hmm. these issues. 
uh, school food is one of the hot topics mm. in Italy. As a matter of fact, uh, the government is trying to implement regulations according to which a much of the food uh, cons cooked and consumed should be organic, mm. which it, it is a good idea. Mm. But again, Italy is small, and think about how many schools are there. And so it turns out that organic food gets imported from all over the place mm -hmm. because they have to, you know, and the more organic food they, um, they use, they also get more funding and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. But at the same time, there is this idea of educating the children to save food, not yes. to waste, to eat everything. Yeah. And it's complicated because some children now are not exposed to all sorts of foods. Mm -hmm. And so when they go to school, they might be a little suspicious. The same thing that happens here, exactly the same. One thing happened in Italy, it doesn't have to do with waste, but it says a lot about globalization in our mm -hmm. culture. A few years ago, there was the attempt of introducing uh, ethnic foods in, in schools. Um, because now schools, I don't know, in large cities like Rome are really, really uh, multicultural. Uh, people coming from all over the world. So there was a good idea of saying, mm -hmm. okay, let's also acculturate the children, get children used to eat foods from other places. Mm -hmm. All hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. You are not going to feed that to my child. That's wow. not good for my child. It's wow. not nutritious. It was, wow. I think it was the f one of the first... Uh, expressions of this growing, unfortunately, growing sense of xenophobia that has yep. gripped Italy in the past yep. four or five years. I don't know if you agree, but it's, it's become, I think, one of the most urgent social problems now. Because the, the polemics right now, the tortellini col pollo in Bologna, I don't know yeah. First of all, we are the only country in which there's still this epic national fight yeah. over, <laughs> over the kind of ingredient. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it's, it's becoming, every time I go back to Italy, it's, it's a different mm. place from what I remember. I grew mm. up and not always in a good way, mm. unfortunately. Well, so, so some of the changes that are happening are, as elsewhere, a result of technological innovation. And you write in your book about the dynamic or tension around culinary Luddism, where uh, many people, particularly the food elites, mm -hmm. harbor a, a nostalgic feeling for the, you know, the traditional foods prepared in traditional ways, uh, art artisanal and, and yep. y using old practices. Uh, and they tend to view with suspicion the modern technologies uh, and, and innovations, but you say, I think quite rightly that the two are not necessarily incompatible um, and that that they're not necessarily at odds. So can you talk a little bit yeah. about that tension in the, the context of contemporary Italian food practice? It, it's quite interesting because in the, starting from the late 80s, early 90s, there's been sort of a rediscovery of not only traditional foods, but also traditional practices, traditional know-how. These have mm. become sort of expensive, uh, sought after products. There is a new respect for the artisan, for the chef. And so there is this sense, okay, we have to go back to the way things were before, but it doesn't make sense. I mean, things are not the way they were before. Of course, you know, we have to be aware of what we do with the soil, for instance, mm -hmm. and making sure we don't overuse it, we don't exploit, um, you know, natural resources, mm -hmm. but technology can help. Mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, yes. to do that. Because now, you know, using certain kind of sensors, you know when the fields need water or not, mm -hmm. you reduce waste of water, which is quite important. Mm -hmm. Now you can use sensors to see if there are, I don't know, pests coming, or there are lots of important issues. If, if Think about food safety. Much of the the gains we've had in, in supply chains is due to technology. The fact that we can follow one ingredient until you know, the end product, I think it's very important. The traceability mm -hmm. would not be possible with, without technology. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. now they are experimenting in using blockchain I wanted to ask you about yeah, that. Yeah, to make the, the whole system Are people familiar safer. with what blockchain is? Do, do you mind defining that Oof, briefly? It's quite complicated. <laughs> I, 
to write that half page in the book, I had to read for one week, just to get a sense of, but basically it's a, it's a system in which not one source can state something. The same information need to be confirmed by other computers in the same network. So that it's not, I can fake you know, the origin of my food. That information is to be confirmed from other people uh, besides me. Uh, that's making it very, very simple. It's one of the most complicated technology, yeah. but probably one of the most promising. And if you think about the whole refrigeration chain, you know, how that has changed Italian food. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that we have fridges, the, the fact that we have freezers, microwaves, you know, mm -hmm. now when people get married, very, usually, very often they get a microwave. Mm -hmm. That's become part of the everyday landscape in Italy. Wow. Wow. Well, let, let's return uh, to the theme of food waste, but here yeah. not so much in the context of the environment and sustainability, but in the context of hunger and food yeah. security. So, you know, we, we've talked about the cucina povera and that for so many generations in, in Italy, uh, the cuisine arose out of, uh, you know, a setting of great scarcity. Yeah. And for many people, that that's now changing, but nonetheless, food insecurity certainly persists, uh, but tends to be maybe invisible in, uh, in wealthier societies now. Uh, and you're layering in, as you alluded to, the influx of new uh, migrants and immigrant, immigrant groups yeah. uh, whose hunger might be more profound, but also less visible. Can you talk about that? Th that's in definitely uh, uh, an important issue and an invisible one. Um, as in many other industrial societies, inequalities are growing enormously in Italy. Uh, but unlike the US or other countries, you know, basically the economy is not growing. If anything, it's staying where it is. Uh, and it's been like this for what now, eight years, something like that. It's, it's bad. Um, so there are lots of people without jobs. Uh, unemployment is a really serious issue. With and all lots the consequences, people with jobs who still can't afford food. Exactly. So th th there is a lot of that, but at the same time, we have these family structures mm -hmm. that protect most people from the worst of hunger. Mm. So if you're <laughs> If you were born and grew up in some place, you might have family and cousins and friends. And so somehow uh, you get to have food even if you don't have much money. Mm -hmm. Of course, the new migrants are not part of these networks. Mm -hmm. And so it can become quite problematic for them, uh, both when they work in any sector, but also especially those that work in food production. Uh, those migrants I was referring to before that pick tomatoes and apples and um, oranges uh, very often has, have close to nothing to eat. Mm. Um, and assertive Italians know, but they don't want to know because that's what allow them to eat cheap fruit mm -hmm. and cheap vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, you know, they're... There is mafia involved and all of that. It's it, it's quite complicated. But uh, now there has been you know reportages and movies about those mm -hmm. situations, mm -hmm. and I th I hope I think more and more Italians are aware of this situation. So the people that produce food for us don't have enough to eat. Yeah. And it, I I was reading about some open air markets in a country that's famous for its open air food markets, where thanks to the relaxation of, uh, of the laws, they can now gather un unused food at yes. the end of the, the market day and distribute it for free to those in the community in need. They're doing it in Alborone, outside of Rome. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it started in Torino. And in Torino, the model they followed uh, was to actually engage uh, migrants from, uh, you know, I think, North Africa and sub you know, the sub-Saharan mm -hmm. area to be the ones to help gather, collect, and distribute the food so that there was some communication across communities and yeah. uh, so that local, you know, longstanding residents could see these mm. you know, migrants of, of color engaged in 
helping other people, not not always or only yeah. being seen as the ones who take. And there are large organizations in Italy and civil society in the church that are still very much working just on that, making sure that people have food and migrants very often become part of these organizations, participate. But, but a, a lot of these efforts are still, as you would acknowledge, I think, in your book, uh, you know, they're, they're helping, but it's not addressing yeah. the bigger systemic issues, which yeah. are obviously big and hard. Uh, so the last chapter of your book asks what, what happens next? And to the extent that, Fabio, you have looked to activate us as consumers, but also as citizens, as citizens uh, you know, what actions would you urge us here yeah to take both individually and collectively to do our role. Yeah, I mean, there are more and more ways of participating, associations, uh, participating, I don't know, in uh, community sustained agriculture, but also what I think it's very important as citizens, we have to be able to push our representatives, our political representative to have food as one of the important topics that has to become part of the conversations. A few years ago, and Marion was there, we had the first mayoral debate in New York where we asked all the candidates to, to talk about what, what, are they, what they would do about food. Mm -hmm. It had never happened before. Mm -hmm. And I think that can only come from pressures from voters. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that, yes, we keep on putting pressure on companies maybe by boycotting things or maybe choosing to buy other things, but these are still, you know, they can change one product or another. The large changes can only happen systemically through mm -hmm. complicated legislations. I mean, yeah. here in the U.S. we have the Farm Bill. You're aware of all the lobbying that goes behind in the farm bill and who has the the largest voices you know who has the deepest pockets mm -hmm. are there ways for citizens to organize in a way and try to sort of limit these pressures and that's the same thing in italy you know the, the companies large companies are extremely powerful although our government you know is a little more um, ready to intervene, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. still there's a lot to do, mm -hmm. definitely. And are you hopeful? I am, I am, because I think food is becoming an important topic in conversations as it was not before. You know, before it was what I like, the recipes, the nice mm -hmm. restaurant, there is more and more, uh, there are discussions about sustainability, about health, about the environment, about accessibility, about all these issues and, you know, the quality of food. I think consumers are more aware, Yes. but, you know, hopefully they will, will be able to, to turn this awareness into desire of, you know, doing something collectively rather than just individual consumers. Great, and I think if you do pick up a copy of Fabio's book, it will give you further ideas and inspiration in how we can be engaged uh, consumer citizens in this increasingly globalized food system. So thank you, Fabio. We have time for some questions, yes. I believe. So. Oh. oh, thank you. Thank you. There is somebody there. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. This is really wonderful. I have a question about how the changing role of women has had an impact on the notion of what is Italian food, how Italian food is made, how the idea of Italian culture is kind of transmitted. So what do you think is the case as oh, we the, the role forward? of women has changed enormously. Right? I'm reading right now a dissertation about food and feminism in Italy and through novels of different authors. So I've been thinking a lot about that. And yes, things have changed enormously, starting from the 60s and the 70s, where there was a whole generation of women that decided that cooking was part of being exploited. And so they decided not to spend time in the kitchen, and above all, they didn't want to teach their daughters to be in the kitchen. That has changed now from the 90s, the aughts, there is a recuperation of food, but in, 
that, that change happened. That generational break, for instance, in the transmission of knowledge has happened. So many people of my generation already had to learn how to cook from the TV and magazines. <laughs> I mean, I've been lucky enough to have a mother who had a full-time job but loved cooking, and so we had two hot meals a day, and we were also asked to be in the kitchen and help. And, but that was quite the exception. Mm. Uh, so there, there has been a, a, a large change. Another change that I've noticed, there are more and more women in the food industry, especially in wine. Mm. In an artisanal products, you see lots of women that make a name for themselves, which might not have been the case before. Still not as much in, resta in restaurants, especially fine dining. Lots of women in trattorias, and, but in fine dining, the chef is still mostly man. Mm. So, uh, thank you so much oh. for the information. Uh, the microphone. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful information about food. And my question to you is, can you comment about food and allergy? Because uh, as you've said, uh, this... Um, giant company that are processing food and we don't know if these are engineering modified or whatever so can you comment on that i mean th that's part of the issue of of food safety in a way what goes into the food that's a question of legislation only legislation can tell companies what they need to put on labels and the discussion the, the lobbying behind labels and here we have marion nessel who's one of the you know, ex experts <laughs> worldwide on the topic. It's huge. I mean, how do we express what's in, in food? Now there are certain countries that are trying to implement systems where they, s they put, you know, a big black thing that says fat or sugar on products to help consumers make choices. Other, other countries have chosen sort of a, a traffic light system with red, yellow, and green. So there are different solutions. Here in the US, we have nothing of that because the pushback is too, is too mm. big. So again, you know, here the single citizen cannot do much. That's something that can only be solved at the legal, at the legislative uh, level. And, and it is a problem, definitely. Thank you. Can you give us an update on the uh, impact that uh, oh, Do you change? mind waiting for the mic so people on the live stream can hear? Can you give us an update on uh, the impact that climate changes have already had on the flu food supply and what is going to look like in the future? What is going to look like? It's difficult to tell. There is more and more... In, uh, concern about making a resilient system, figure out ways to, uh, I don't know, select varieties of plant that react better to drought or extreme rain and whatnot. But for instance, a place like Italy, which is already fragile, historically mm -hmm. fra fragile, it's a huge problem. I mean, sometimes we, you have rain and the whole hills fall down. It's been always a problem, but that's becoming more and more urgent. And I suspect that it's already impacting the food system. I mean, last, um, last summer there were huge rains uh, that have damaged many, um, many harvests. And the same thing is happening now. So it's hard to tell what it will look like, but definitely we have to urgently need to take better care of the landscape, of the land itself, and the water. That's the most urgent, because it's clear that we're going to have more and more extreme events. And, That's and not going to change. And there's the paradox of the, the vicious circle, in a way, too, where as uh, you may need to begin importing more foods from further away, yeah. that has its own climate impact. Yeah, that it's and agriculture is one of the major factors in climate change. It's not the impact of climate change of agriculture, but mm. what does agriculture do in terms of climate change? Monocultures are not good in terms of climate, definitely not. There's... Oh. Hey, Fabio. Hey. I want to add on to it. I read an interesting article um, in the New York Times food section, and they're actually were addressing um, uh, wine production 
um, really trying to be resilient. Um, what used to be in the valleys, they turn more higher elevation. Now we're looking at um, England is now producing wine, champagne. Wow, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so do you see that type of action happening with agriculture, so food agriculture? I did some research on that, so happens, mm -hmm. because I'm doing work in Poland, and it turns out that Poland now has a, a wine industry. Uh, and not only Poland, we started looking at other northern country and I started visiting vineyards in Denmark. They're producing wine in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So my, my thought was like, okay, let me talk to some winemakers in Italy and see if they're having the opposite problem. So it's becoming very hot. So in some parts of Italy, now they start uh, harvesting grapes as early as late August. I talked with the producers, and they were like, well, you know, there are years that are hotter, here there are cooler, there is rain. There is still not a strong sense of a long-term climate change. They're still looking at the annual harvest and what they're gonna do to get the best out of their plants. I was quite surprised hmm. by that. Uh, I didn't speak with many, it was the beginning, I was trying to see if that was an interesting research. Mm -hmm. That sort of answer, that was the most interesting. Why are you not looking at this in terms of, you know, what's happening from here to 20, in, in 20 years, rather than seeing, okay, how do I salvage this year's vintage? And I think that's, that's quite interesting, that would deserve a research. Yeah, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, the food packaging, meat, fish, uh, chicken, etc., have an expiration date. Is there any general guideline how long you can still consume the food after the expiration date? Expiration date and best use by are two different things. Expiration date is in very few food items. And if it's an expiration date, you shouldn't eat after it. Best buy means that the food is still good. That's one of the big culprits in food waste. You know, companies want to cover themselves mm -hmm. and they want to make sure- And sell more products. Yeah, and sell more products. There's also that. And so there is this best buy, but very often it's still, it's still good. It depends from food to food. When you open, you should be able to, with smell and sight and, but you know, many, many uh, packaged food can be used much longer than the best buy date. Of course, that's different for fresh foods, but fresh foods, you know when the fish is not good or the meat is not good, it's, I mean, it's, so we have to be careful about that. Well, and in, in your technology section, you talked a bit about smart domestic appliances that will now keep tabs for you on the viability yeah. and safety and of your food. Not only that, they're looking at wrap, wrappings, material that can help you know when actually the food goes bad, besides the date. So, you know, sort of being sensitive to the chemical changes in the food and change color. So there is research in this direction, precisely to avoid the issue of the best buy. Okay. <laughs> You talked about the culinary dogmatism of Italians to mm. not want their traditional methods um, adulterated. <laughs> I was wondering if there's any thought in the country about where their traditional methods came from. They certainly came from other traditions, didn't they? I mean, that's a very complicated <laughs> issue in Italy right now. Uh, that's an example I always like to mention. A few years ago, a certain party decided to cook polenta on the streets as a representative of local food, and uh, the poster said, yes to polenta, no to couscous. <laughs> but it so happened that couscous has been in Italy much longer than polenta, because the Arabs brought it there in the ninth century, and polenta arrived in the 16th century. Wow. So if you look at history, you know, of course our food comes from everywhere. Italy has been occupied by everybody and their mothers and grandmothers. I mean, <laughs> of course our food comes from everywhere. 
But there is this idea. I think partly it's the result of our historical development, Risorgimento, the first cookbook, Pellegrin Artusi, was written in 1891, right after the unification. So there is this sense of creating an Italian food. But definitely our food is, has been globalized since day one. The Romans, they loved foreign foods. I mean, if you were rich, you had access to cherries from the Middle East or the sp those specific fish, fishes from certain areas of the Mediterranean or peaches. And so it's always been there. It's just that sometimes for political and cultural reasons, we prefer not to mm -hmm. think about it too much. So two more questions, Fabio, time-wise? Two, okay. Uh, one second, the microphone. Hi, thank you for this very interesting talk. I was curious about olive oil. A few years ago, there was a story going around about the fake olive oil in Greece and Italy, and I'm wondering if anything's been done to rectify yeah, yeah, it yeah, so yeah. we know when we're buying olive oil, it's olives, not canola. Uh, that's <laughs> one of the cases in which big scandals have helped the industry. Mm. Because now people realize that you have to have a straight game to, to sell. Of course, there are also cheaper oils. But in that case, you know, you would only see bottled in Italy, for instance, which is legally correct. And it means that the oil can come from anywhere in the Mediterranean and, and then it's bottled in Italy and exported with an Italian name. So yeah. it's also up to the consumer to be a little more careful about what they choose. But definitely after those scandals, also the... Oil, olive oil industry has been trying to impose stricter standards because they realized they were risking their market. So in that case, their interest was also our interest. Do you want to pick the last question? I don't know. <laughs> uh, the person back there, I don't know. I, I don't see very well with the, <laughs> my eyes. <laughs> Tal, thank you so much for being here for your talk. Um, I was wondering if you can touch a little bit more about uh, regenerative uh, agriculture and the mm -hmm. interplay with uh, an ever-changing globalized uh, economy mm -hmm. and civilization and how you see that cultural shift happening. I mean, that's one of the, the cases in which, you know, traditions and technology could work together because to study regenerative agriculture, you really have to understand the soil, the chemistry, the, uh, the ecology, and so you need you know, science, you cannot just keep on doing what farmers used to do 100 years ago. Very often, 100 years ago, the idea was like, okay, I give it more medicine so the plant feels better. And so plants would be covered in tons of pesticides and, and, and stuff like that. In Italy, there is a, a strong sense of, you know, the, the we call it genuinità, the, the, the being, uh, authenticity, but also genuinity in the sense of the food that has to be food. Uh, and so regenerative agriculture from this point of view has deep roots. But at the same time, there are also, you know, large um, industry and not just industry, large uh, organizations of ag industrial agriculture that push in other directions. And of course, there you have the double market. You have the market of the, f the fruit and the vegetables that come from you know, uh, well-tended fields. Mm -hmm. uh, they are organic, usually. They are uh, specific varieties, but they come with a pretty high price. And then you have the fruit that comes from the large sort of plantations. We don't, I, mean, I don't know how to call them, but you know, large fields of apples, a large field of peaches, uh, of not wheat because, as I said, we don't have much room for wheat. Um, those are much cheaper. Um, also, you see the difference when you go to the market, the, the, the vegetables, like here, you know, that comes with the farmer is more expensive because you know what you're paying for and there is less use of uh, pesticides, for instance, so they require more labor. Let's say people understand the value of that. Not everybody can afford it. Mm -hmm. Like in the rest of the world, that's also something we need to think about. Great. Well, that's right. a wonderful note to end on. Please join me in thanking Fabio Thank again. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much.